Disgraced sports broadcaster Richard Keyes is someone I'd known for a number of years, despite not being particularly good company. He's someone I'd always felt a slight kinship with. In the late 80s, we'd been up for presenting a video for HM Revenue and Customs. Then HM Customs and Excise, would you believe? Funny how names for things change. About the consequences of submitting your tax return late. On paper, it was a very strong video. Taut script, compelling central idea, don't be a late laddie. Terrific location, Highgate Cemetery. And in Dominic Grelland, one of the best corp vid directors in the business. Richard and I both wanted the gig very much. We screen tested separately and chatted in the lift on the way out. In a quiet moment, Richard revealed that he was self-conscious about the back of his hands, which, in adulthood, had started to become slightly hairy. It really wasn't that noticeable, but since it was bothering him, I told him he should give them a quick shave. In the end, I didn't get the job, but neither did Richard. Hunniford gazumped us both, and I thought little more about it until a few months later, at a barbecue to mark the launch of Homebase's new barbecues, when I saw him again. Seeing me, his face hardened, and he stormed over. Thanks a fucking lot, he said. I looked at him blankly, and he held up his hands. How to describe them? Until then, the phrase Black Forest made me think of the famous 80s Gatto. But from that day on, Black Forest will always remind me of the back of Richard Key's hands. Richard had shaved them, as I suggested, but the hair had grown back. Boy, had it grown back. It was at least six times thicker than it had been, as if each follicle was sprouting a palm tree's worth of jet black hair, a frighteningly virulent jungle of pelt. I didn't know that would, I spluttered, but Richard suspected sabotage, convinced I'd tricked him into hairing up his hands to make him less telegenic and prevent him from getting any future work that he and I might be vying for. A darkness fell over Richard that day, and our relationship never truly recovered. You see, the old Richard, or Ricky, as he was more frequently known, had harboured dreams of light entertainment. He saw himself as a Mr. Saturday Night figure, hosting a shiny floor show on ITV, or the Generation Game Slash Blankety Blank slot on BBC One. But he developed a hang-up about his hands, a hand gup that marooned him in the more prosaic world of sports broadcasting leading to a 20-year career as Sky Sports' face of football, a sport he has secretly never liked, much less understood. I don't propose to relitigate what Richard did or didn't say off-air to lose his job at Sky. That's between him and whichever women he spoke of hanging out the back of. All I know is that I've never been a fan of bawdy locker room talk, both because it's wrong and because the other boys don't include me. So when he did get the old heave-ho... Footnote, I use the word ho advisedly here, from Sky, I didn't pick up the phone. Instead, Keyes and his exceptionally Scottish co-host Andy Gray upped sticks to Qatar, a fresh start and good for them. In fact, it annoys me when people assume they didn't learn the lesson just because they migrated to the Middle East to front football coverage for hardline Muslims. And while they sent round Robin emails boasting of their new life over there, with photographs, careful not to feature too many Muslims in the background, I gave them short shrift and we lost touch. So when I bumped into the two of them on the concourse at Gatwick with my own television career in the toilet, I expected a smirk, if not a smirk, a snort, or if not a snort, a sneer. Instead, Richard hugged me. I'd enjoyed good hugs before then. Me and my ex-wife Carol were prolific huggers, with hugs, squeezes and pats gradually coming to replace kissing and lovemaking entirely, certainly once she started buffing her fitness instructor. I've hugged Sally Gunnell, drunk. I've hugged former DJ and now busker Dave Clifton, live on air. I hugged my maths teacher at least once a week before he was told to stop. And I've even hugged Sir Geoffrey Archer, after the daft ape had won his libel case against the Daily Star, little realising the spotty-backed bastard had gone and bloody perjured himself. I once had a superb hug with a masseuse I hadn't realised was a sex worker. And while that embrace cost me £150, it remains up there in my personal pantheon of good cuddles but the hug I received at the hands and arms of Richard Keyes tops the lot. It had empathy, meaning, trust, wit. Footnote, the hug incorporated a side-to-side rock and warmth. It's OK, Alan, it's OK, he said. And Mock punched me on the jaw, stopping his fist an inch away from my face, but close enough for his knucklehead to brush me lightly. The real Alan is still in there. You just have to tease him out. Andy grunted in assent and said, You shake good the door. I looked at Richard. He said, you should come to Doha. I smiled. Tell him thanks. Thanks, said Richard. Ni boor. I looked at Richard. He said, no bother. I looked at Richard, then looked at the planes on the concourse. 
Then I nodded once, walked to the Emirates desk, and bought a return ticket to Doha for that very evening. Enough time for my assistant to drive to my house, pack and bring my case to the airport so long as she was brisk and didn't dawdle. That night I landed in the sweltering Gulf state, tired but excited, and bursting with information about the little-known nation, thanks to the in-flight magazine and the tedious man I'd been sitting next to. So much so that I thanked the guys on passport control for providing the very oil that had propelled the aircraft over. They frowned at me and I moved on. Richard had suggested lunch the next day, and we reconvened in a steakhouse where Richard was very much the star of the show, waving and nodding at anyone who said hello. They're all expats, expats who enjoy beef, he said. Andy chuckled, they should call them cowpats. I looked to Richard. He said they should call them cowpats. Oh, that's good, I said, that's very good. Tell him that's very good. He nodded, that's very good, Andy. It would be the last time I laughed for some time. Because seemingly out of nowhere, Richard started to behave in an extremely mean way. For example, when I said, this steak is wonderfully tender, Richard repeated, this steak is wonderfully tender, but in a muley, whiny baby voice. I wasn't sure what he meant by it, so said nothing. But later when I said, do you know where I can buy some Bermuda shorts? Richard glanced at Andy and said, do you know where I can buy some Bermuda shorts? In a baby voice before shouting to the waiter, Alan's getting this. To my chagrin, I didn't find out where I could buy Bermuda shorts, but I did pay for steak, onion rings, chips and drinks for the whole table. Confused and hurt, I nevertheless agreed to meet the next day. Their behaviour the next morning was, if anything, worse. For example, Andy had his telescope with him and kept looking at distant holiday makers. If he saw one he liked the look of, he'd nudge Richard and hand in the telescope so he could look too. But whenever I asked if I could have a turn, both men ignored me. They also made disparaging comments about my lack of suntan, my sandals and my career failures. In front of their sniggering friends, they'd asked me about the viewing figures of my chat show or the ageing demographic of my radio audience. It was Alan baiting as sport, and suddenly I remembered hearing rumours that they'd treated other presenters in a similar way. Ray Stubbs had supposedly endured a similar teasing a couple of years ago and flew home in tears after nine days. Patrick Kilty didn't even last a week. But this... This was just mean. This was really, really mean. Of course, I'd assumed these horror stories were just tittle-tattle. No one would believe that of Messrs. Keys and Gray. But here I was being pulled apart like carrion in the Middle Eastern sun. The final straw came the following day. Richard and Andy offered to drive me out to soak up the sights and sounds of a local marketplace so that I could experience what they called the real Qatar. But no sooner had we arrived than Andy started hopping from foot to foot. Gutti gun pesh. I looked at Richard. He has to go and piss, he explained, before adding he also needed a wee. I was told to wait there, and the two disappeared to find a lavatory. But twenty-five minutes later, I'd come to accept that they weren't coming back. I'd been tricked. And now, in the midday heat, I was stranded in a foreign land, far from home. I felt lost and queasy among the teeming locals and bustling vendors. Where the hell was I? This was a place where the indigenous people would come to buy and sell produce and trade the latest finery. But I felt dizzy, struggling to process the swirl of unfamiliar people and unfamiliar culture. I admit, I felt frightened. If this market hadn't been an air-conditioned shopping mall, I shudder to think what would have become of me. At least we had these back home, but some of the brands were new to me and the experience was completely disorienting. Where was T.M. Lewin? Where was M&S? Nowhere to be seen. One of the elders, who bowed deeply and wore a badge that said customer services, guided me to the metro station, and despite being shaken and thirsty, certainly until I bought some seven-up, I was able to find my way back to the apartment complex. By now the scales had fallen from my eyes. It was all so obvious. Far from rising above our fallout all those years ago, Keyes had held on to it like you would a dry cleaning receipt and allowed it to fester. This was revenge. How could I have been so foolish? Trudging back to my apartment, I saw Keys and Grey, plus a coterie of their chuckling chums, eating pizza on the sun lounges by the pool. In the corner of my eye, I saw a patch of hot cheese slide from the slice Grey was holding and fall steaming and sizzling onto his naked thigh. He hissed, Fucking you! This time I didn't need Keys to translate fucking hell, but I didn't even allow myself a smile. I packed quickly and furiously and neatly. Then I wheeled my case back down to the ground floor to call a cab. Grey, Keys and friends were still munching the much-loved Italian snack, 
but I strode in the other direction. I wasn't going to give them the satisfaction. But then another thought. No, I will. And with a clenched jaw and two tensed buttocks, I marched over to the pool area. Keys looked up. You and you are dicks, I shouted. Do you hear me? You're not nice. And while I'm getting things off my chest, get this. I can't tell what you're saying. And I think you have too much hair on your hands. And if that was my fault, then I'm glad. Because bad things should happen to bad people, and you are bad people. So stick this country up your asses, Richard, and... I'm sorry I've forgotten your name, Andy. I looked at Richard angrily. Andy. Andy, I repeated. Now I'm going to the airport, and if you think we're still friends, you can eat swivel. I'd been caught between the phrase eat shit and swivel, but fortunately I'd pretty much run out of breath when I arrived at this part of the sentence, so I'm not sure anyone noticed. Silence and then, almost imperceptibly, the sound of a single clap. It had come from Andy. He clapped again, then again. Soon Richard joined in, louder and faster. They were applauding me. I was incandescent, like when Kirsty Allsop sees a single mum. But before I could react, I noticed they were both smiling, and I mean genuinely smiling, and Richard was approaching with his arms outstretched like a very hairy Jesus. "'You did it!' he said. "'I knew you'd do it!' Do what, I replied. You found it, Alan. You found the fire. That's when I realized the whole thing had been engineered, brilliantly engineered, to stoke the flame that had died inside me. It was their contention that I'd allowed the inferno that rocketed me to the very top to dwindle to, at most, glowing embers. And so they'd taken a wrecking ball to the weak, diminished Alan I had become. They had squeezed together their bellows and blown out warm air onto my glowing embers, reigniting the inferno inside me, and in doing so had given me the vigour for what lay ahead. For they were helping me to create Alan 2.0. Andy offered me some of his pizza. I was immensely grateful, but declined because he'd scooped off the meat bits, leaving deep trenches where his fingers had gouged through the now cold cheese. I stayed in Qatar, sleeping in Richard's spare room for another four months. It wasn't all plain sailing, sometimes it was actually quite tedious, but the oil-rich Gulf nation seemed to chime with the freewheeling creative person I needed to become. I found the country, its geography, its culture, its anything-goes attitude, footnote, provided you're in the confines of one of the areas designated for Westerners, its profound spirituality deeply, deeply inspiring. People think it's all shakes and futuristic skyscrapers, but it also has underwater restaurants where you watch fish swim while eating dead ones. Mind-blowing. At weekends, we'd fly out to Dubai or Saudi and soak up the culture there, visiting a shopping mall, hotel or Gordon Ramsay restaurant, anywhere with air conditioning and toilets. My mind constantly being open to the new, the fresh, the different. I could feel my eyes widening, my soul swelling, my ears widening as well, and my horizons also widening. At night we ate steak or pizza. Richard would tell a long story about persecution and redemption. It was clear he regarded himself as a kind of Christ figure, mainly because he often used the phrase me and Jesus when discussing his career blip. Less appallingly, he said encouraging things about my own skill set, and was firmly of the belief that with a change of mindset I could achieve great things. How right he was. Over the coming weeks, Richard, and to a much lesser extent, Andy, completely dismantled my approach to broadcasting and rebuilt me from the ground up. Over time, I was able to secure corporate broadcasting work in the area for a private airline, a fledgling hotel chain, helicopter tours, and forex trading. It was utterly fulfilling and demonstrated beyond any doubt whatsoever that I had what it took to be an on-camera television broadcaster, and Richard and Andy couldn't have been more encouraging. Yes, it has its critics, Richard would say, those who quibble about its stance on human rights or gay people or what women can and can't do. But no country is perfect. If you ask us, the West could do with getting its own house in order before it starts libeling other countries. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone, I said. But I was advised not to use that phrase, as that's the sort of thing they say at the start of a stoning, and people might take it as a signal to throw rocks at someone. 